Jesus, go on. Let's do, go ahead. Do the deposition. <laughs> My grandchild was playing with it, and I can't get it off. But I am not a cow. <laughs> That's great. My students, thank you for checking in with me so that I know that you're here. And at 11.05, I think I will uh, formally bring this, this court to order, if you will. Um, thank you all for joining us, particularly uh, Dr. Foman, from all the way from Westchester University. Uh, and we'll get a chance to learn more about her in just a moment. And I would be remiss if I did not also thank uh, Dr. Lynch, who, although retiring, has left us with this gift of the DEI Facilitator uh, Certification Program, our first here at at Kane, and we're really excited about it and see so many people joining us as well today for it. Uh, also joined today by um, Professor Sandra Bowden Lerner, who is one of our adjunct instructors in the School of Communication, Media, and Journalism. She'll be introducing Dr. Foman in just a moment. And for anybody who, who might have been familiar with that name, uh, Professor Bowden Lerner is the magic behind our listening course, which I think some of you are, are registered for. So there is the, the face to the name, and certainly uh, get a chance to register that when you get a chance. Um, so a couple of quick things. Uh, Dr. Lynch, I think you said this last time we started off in December, I'll say it again. You know, we continue to start this journey uh, that students are now on towards having these difficult conversations and, and committing themselves to a certification in it to be able to facilitate them more effectively in the classroom, outside of the classroom, at Kane, and well beyond the, uh, the borders of Kane as well. And, you know, I was looking back at that first lecture that Dr. Baker did, and it's really true. You know, DEI, thankfully, is a conversation we're having now in workplaces, in classrooms, and everywhere in between. Uh, and I think there's no better time than now to have these conversations, and I think no better place than Kane, because uh, we clearly can see the commitment the university is making. Um, also, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. There are so many of them. Um, the Global Studies Program and Dr. Sarah Compion, uh, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, in addition to that, the College of Liberal Arts, and last but certainly not least, the Holocaust Resource Center. And I should mention that as well, because today, for anybody who's not aware, is actually International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, and this is noted because on this day in 1945, as the Red Army moved across Poland, first with Warsaw and then Krakow, uh, they also began liberating the Auschwitz camp and, and the truths and, and the horrors of what the Holocaust really was uh, came to light for the rest of the world. So it is important to remember that too. Uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to Professor Sandra gordon Lerner to introduce our speaker for today. Sandra? Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see you. This is super exciting. Uh, I am, as most of you remember, we last met when Dr. Baker spoke to us, and my big takeaway from that was his reframe on what he called challenging conversations. He suggested that we look at all conversations as opportunities. What a great thing. And today, Dr. Anita Bowman is going to give us another reframe. As the director of the DNA Discussion Project uh, out of Westchester, PA. Uh, like, you know what, I'm from Westchester, New York, so I have to slow down when I say the University of Westchester University. And she's the professor, professor of communication and media at Westchester. Uh, she has been doing this really interesting research on how knowing your DNA, knowing what your true ancestry is, where you actually come from, can make it easier to have conversations about race. So today she's gonna to tell us some about her fascinating research. She's also gonna give us some practical tips on how to approach more challenging conversations. And because you're gonna find her fascinating and you're gonna to wanna to know more, you might want to pick up her book, Who Am I? Identity in the Age of Consumer DNA Testing. I hope you're okay with the plug, Anita. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and if you think some of this sounds familiar, it is because Dr. Foman has been covered in all sorts of impressive media, including the New York Times, the NPR, the Washington Post, the BBC News Hour, National Geographic, and we are so lucky to have you here today, Dr. Foman. Thank you so much. Let's welcome her. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, let me start out by mentioning, just because I'm sort of identified by the DNA Project, um, how I got into that and then relate it to what I'm going to talk today, because it's sort of back to the beginning. Um, and uh, I started out by teaching intercultural communication 
there was actually an intercultural communication class at Westchester, but it was defined by international communication. And people talked about, you know, communication uh, you know, around the world, which was relevant and interesting, but people were having these struggles within this country. And so I brought to that conversation discussions about how different groups within the United States we're trying to have communication. And I started to talk about race and culture and you know, it shocked people and people didn't really know what I was doing. And that was before something called intercultural communication as we know it today even existed, diversity discussions. And people would ask me exactly, what are you doing? So um, I did that for many years and, and helped to define and you know, published, et cetera, in, in the area and helped to define some of the intercultural communication work. And then fortuitously about 20 years ago now, there was a grant at Westchester because Westchester was doing some of the basic things to bring in more students of color, et cetera. Uh, but they were trying to get to the next level in talking about diversity. And there was a grant that was offered to somebody who had a novel way of talking about diversity. And at the time, I was interested in uh, genetics just because I was. I bet some of you have heard of the Human Genome Project, where the human genome was, was mapped, as, and it was basically the recipe for a human. And um, somebody, because I was so interested in it, people would send me articles all the time. And somebody sent me an article, I think it was Discovery Magazine that said, they're learning to trace your ancestry based on your genetic profile. And I'm like, I bet there are people walking around who have no idea what's in their background. And so I had to look around and find a lab that could do what I wanted. Every test was $450. And I you know, found three people who were willing, one black, one white, one who identified as biracial, to be tested. And the tests were very rudimentary. And the, the fascinating thing is, as I said, again, nobody knew what I was talking about. And then the tests started coming down in price. And when they hit $99, everybody was getting tested. And I'm wondering, you can do your little response by using a hand. Has anybody here ever been DNA tested or know anybody who's been ancestry tested in your family? I see some, good, I see some hands popping up. And people were finding, oh great, a lot of hands popping up. People were finding out fascinating things about their background and finding relatives that they didn't know. And, and so anyway, transitioning into the core of my lecture here, I'd, lo I'd love to ask more questions about that, but let me do my lecture today. And maybe at the end, if somebody wants to jump in with their profile, I'll be happy to hear it. And, and so based on that project, people were coming to talk about race with a different attitude. It wasn't as defensive. It wasn't as angry. It wasn't as, why are you dragging me here to diversity training? People started talking about their backgrounds in fascinating and very personal, intricate ways. And things popped up in their narratives that they didn't know about you know, where they were from. And one of my favorite comments was, gee, if I didn't know this about myself, what am I not thinking enough about with somebody else and on this whole topic of race? So having said that, let me share my screen and move into the conversation that we're gonna to have today, which is having conversations about, you know, difficult conversations about diversity. And uh, I wanna broaden this, we certainly can talk about race, but I also, if some of you have issues about um, gender or sexual identity or any of those things, please, that's a part of this conversation as well. So feel free to, you know, post in the chat or raise your hand if, if need be. And uh, I will uh, certainly appreciate hearing from you. So the first thing I want to ask, and you can just put this in the, the chat, and we can try to pick some of these. Have your experiences generally been good or bad in conversations about diversity? If you're talking about diversity, have your experiences generally been pretty positive in talking to other people on these topics, or have they been maybe negative? Can people just type in in the chat so I can get some ideas of, of what people are experiencing? And you can just write good or bad, uh, more, more so negative, uh, sometimes good, mostly bad. Wow, this is a, a bad, and you're somebody good, bad, sometimes good and bad. So, so all right, so it's it's really all over the place. Very uh, that's yeah, very stereotypical 
bad, bad ones, good ones on why we have to talk about this. Thank you for all of these interesting comments. And let me ask you, what topics are most likely to be bad or, or challenging? Can you just type in gender, race, income, whatever, race, that, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah, race, <laughs> race, race, race. <laughs> okay, so race tends to be one. And uh, yeah, gender, sexuality also is a note. These are great. Uh, and thank you, somebody put in disability. All of these things can be quite uh, challenging. So as we talk, think about these kinds of conversations and how my suggestions might relate to you and feel free to raise your hand and uh if you do uh, somebody will call on you and and point to me to uh to discuss all right so research tells us that even though these conversations are difficult when we really talk to people in a meaningful and important way about diversity that we do build understanding and we do build positive actions, positive change in behavior among people. It does make a difference because you can feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. Why am I talking about this? Um, but it does make a difference for us to talk and, and just relating to Sandra to listen to each other on these topics. So this is important stuff. One of the first things that you wanna think about when you were talking to somebody with whom you disagree and people who had bad experiences think about these people have good experiences ask yourself are you doing this consciously or implicitly do you have some norms do you have some norms that you tend to follow no interrupting or talking over one another how many times do we listen just enough to start yelling back our position and i'm sure those of you in the listening class have been talking about this. Listening is different than trying to just interject your, your own point or win or whatever it might be. So one of the thing is, you know, don't interrupt, let somebody speak. Also, give everyone a chance to speak. You will often find that two or three people are dominating a conversation if you're in a, a group, and even if two people are talking, that one person's really doing all the talking and the other person's doing all the receiving. I have actually gotten to the point in conversations where you time people. You know, you get two minutes to talk and I get two minutes to talk. You've seen people with the talking stick where you have to have the stick in your hand to talk. Everyone gets a chance to speak. Everybody has the right to speak. Everybody has something to add to the conversation. And particularly on the conversation of race, it doesn't belong to one person and it's everybody's responsibility. How often do we talk about race and everybody turns around in the room and looks at a certain person or a couple of people and they ask them to speak on behalf of the entire group as if it was there on their shoulders, their responsibility. And even when other people are speaking, they're sort of passing it back and passing the ball back to the, that person. Everybody speaks, everybody has some responsibility. No personal attacks. Um, I don't know if you studied the ad hominem attack, but you know, you're just a this or you're just a that. Um, somebody once said in one of my classes, a woman made a very strong comment about, uh, about uh, sexual oppression and a person in my class, and he didn't say it out loud, he said it quietly, I think she's just a lesbian. And I'm like, what is, what's your point about that? <laughs> Does that mean, I don't know what her sexual identity is or not, but are you trying to identify her point is not important because of who she is? Like, explain that. So no personal attack, ad hominem attacks. What is somebody saying? Even if you disagree with somebody, there's usually a note of, of factual information in what they're saying that is outside of the person that they are. She's just an old lady or he, she's just a kid or he's just, you know, whatever it might be. And finally on this, I think that's finally, <laughs> speak only for yourself. Even, sometimes we think we can speak for our entire group, our entire age, our entire race, or, and, and, or, or ask somebody else to. <laughs> Speaking for all African-Americans everywhere, or all Muslims, or all gay people, or all, you know, whatever, transgender, you can only speak for yourself. And everybody's experience is a one-off. I don't care who you are. Everybody's experience is a one-off. I'm talking to people right now on my um, discussion of um, talking about race, 
And one of the neatest things is that rather than having like one Asian person, one Latinx person, one, I, I will have two Asian people speak and they have very different points of view based on their background experience, two African-Americans, two Muslim people. So speak only for yourself. And let me just ask you, and you can pop this in the chat if you'd like, any other rules that you would add in terms of the norms that you like when you're talking to people about race? Is there anything that you think, when I'm talking to people about difficult topics, I don't want them to do this, or I want them to do that? Can anybody think of it? I know it's hard on the, um, I know it's hard on the spur of the moment. But if there's anything you think, gee, when I'm talking to somebody, this would really help. And, and uh, you don't have to answer now. If it comes to mind, just pop it in the, the, the chat. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here. Well, you guys are great. Uh, respect another person's views. Listen. And, and it, thank you. There's a genius in here because Steve Covey, who studies this, or maybe you have a great teacher who studies this all the time, says, you know, first, you want to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. This is wonderful. Um, don't assume that you're not biased. That's a great one. These are all wonderful. And if any of you see some, any of you other faculty people jump in and say them, because I can't read them all and look, okay. Ask them to explain further instead of getting angry at a short response. That's great. And, and here, it, let me add a practical one. I was just doing a training yesterday and I said, when it's hard to listen, what do you do? And somebody said, I have a glass of water with me. I take a drink of water to stop myself from talking. Uh, listen and not have a response back, but to understand this is, this is wonderful. So as I said, you must have a fabulous teacher. And I also saw somebody um, supporting what someone else said, which is wonderful. And he said, yes, Matthew. Um, yeah, don't assume you're not biased. And yes, Matthew, on that, that one. And listen with an open mind. So these are all wonderful things. And sometimes if you can make them explicit like that, just like, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated that you came up with some right on the spur of the moment. If you can say, can, you know, can we just assume that everybody has biases? Can we just, uh, you know, let somebody finish their, their statement? Can we say, ask somebody a question before you make a response to that person? The more explicit you can make these rules and norms, and in formal diversity training, there should always be ground rules. But sometimes you're talking to your mother or your cousin or your friend or whatever. And so you have to be conscious of making those norms and, and, and rules. Some useful guidelines as you're going along include um, to be curious and seek to understand the perspective of others and uh, ask open-ended questions. Sometimes just tell me more about this. Try to listen without judgment. Try to just, just restate what, so are you saying this? Are you saying that? Um, yeah, uh, let, let me try to pull out what I, you know, what I agree with you on that. So a curious mind is, is really important. And you, you've heard people say that, you know, people who are sort of, you know, talk about other people, that's kind of the, the, the low level. And then people who talk about ideas and are excited about ideas, so you're listening to somebody not so much, you know, for gossip or whatever, and certainly confidentiality is something that you want to keep in mind, but to really be curious about people. I am so often just curious about how people um, behave. And just in terms of questions, sometimes people want to ask a question like, what's the matter with you? But the, the assumption is, the assumption has to be, this person is rational and normal based on their own background. And a friend of mine who's very conservative said to me, Anita, you're conservative too. You're conserving the, va conserving the values that you grew up with. So I am. I mean, I just grew up with a different, different outlook. Um, so one of the states, so I try to give a, a kind of a statement that might help people in these situations. Uh, is this what you're saying? So to say somebody, you know, is, is this what you're saying? Let me, let me try to, uh, let me try to pose this to you so I'm, saying it, you know, I'm understanding what you're saying. So that's, that's a, a, a statement that you can use. And by the way, practicing by looking in the mirror is just fine. So uh, I, uh, one of my friends said to me, um, 
I, I had gotten in, into a conflict with somebody. I was very annoyed. And I said, I should have said this. I should have said that. And she said, don't worry, it's going to happen again. And I thought, that's true. How often does something happen to you just once? And so the next time, be ready to behave better. And not with a shot. Be ready to do something that you think is going to take the conversation forward. And now this is one that comes from a, 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 a well established diversity trainer and you really have to be careful with this one she says lean into your fears and discomfort as a way to um i don't know if i have a type of because uh, i can't see all my whole slide as a way to create honest engagement and that doesn't mean you know i to say something that's going to be offensive to somebody or um to say something that's going to put people off but let me just explain this to say uh, I think I maybe even had a quote. This is hard for me because if you, I see, I don't think it should say prevent. Uh, as I said, I think this slide is bad there. So just ignore if it says prevent honest engagement. Um, so um, in, in this case, rather than pretending that you don't have any prejudices, to explain why you have prejudices, somebody told me that in her neighborhood whenever somebody got money and just spent it and didn't put it into a saving account that they described it as being the n-word rich and so she grew up with this whole profile that african americans don't save they're sort of you know just reactive and so she said it was hard for her to get over that prejudice I've heard people say the th same thing about Muslims. Um, I've, I've heard, and, and we were talking about sexual identity. I don't know how many of you grew up with people making the assumption that somebody who was gay was deficient or something was wrong with them. And so uh, the argument here is sort of come clean, talk about your background. Maya Angelou says, we all see the world from the rock that we stand on. What? rock are you standing on and and i don't want to get uh, to, I, I would tell stories all day but i want to tell this short story years ago um i i lived in california there was a uh, and, and it was when people were like it's not like the fancy california it was very rugged back then i was a college student and there was a guy who would get drunk every thursday night and come home and whenever he would come back to the student housing it was n word this n word that and it was very upsetting i didn't grow up in a neighborhood where people did that and finally i got up in his face and i said what is your problem with black people and i was actually ready for a confrontation and the guy started explaining to me how he'd grown, grown up in this German neighborhood. His father was a German immigrant and the neighborhood turned black and the kids started to beat him up every day. And as a result of that, he had all this racism against African-Americans. And, and I thought like, I would never do that to you. My brother would never do that to you. Like, why are you spreading all this hate? And we talked for like three hours and you know the guy was drunk so um, you know he was like weeping telling me this story but the, but the i had never heard somebody who was working class white talk like that and so having an understanding of where that came from softened my response to him and his response to me he never heard anybody talk about structural racism he was a hurt kid so having these conversations is powerful and important you self-talk visualization and believe in the value of your efforts keep trying talk to yourself you know start keep working on this working through things that you believe uh, facing your um your uh, racism and and your fear it, it's hard to grow up in this society and not feel that certain people are better than others it's it's in the air whatever whether that's heterosexual or wealthy or whatever it might be um have the courage to speak your own truth even when you're anxious fearful or uncertain and you know feel free to say i can only speak to my own experience and i may not say this very well uh, i have at one of my questions that i ask people is what keeps you from talking and the two things that keep people from talking is they're afraid they'll say something quote dumb and make themselves look like a fool or often you know they'll say I'll, I'll look racist or i'll look like the angry you know muslim the angry gay person it always when you minor the minority person it's the angry hostile radical and the majority person worries about looking like racist sexist homophobic all that and the other one is being humiliated by having people call you 
the radical, the, the racist, the whatever it might be. And so I would say, again, if play, it's likely to happen, what will you do? If somebody says to me, you're a radical, if somebody says to me, you're just saying this to try to like get your way, to try to make us do what you want, I know what I'm gonna say to that. I'm gonna say, tell me what in my comment is, is wrong. You know, like don't, don't make an ad hominem attack, but tell me what it is that you disagree. Why are you saying that? And the people I know who are the best at this, rather than getting to in that very moment when you want to run out the door and be defensive is when you ask a question somebody says like you're just a racist the person who's best at dialogue says tell me why you think that lean into that how do you see me what have i done to make you feel that way and so what we often see as the end of a dialogue is the beginning of one and know that this is not one conversation. This is not one, not every conversation is going to end with, you know, you're running off and marrying the person. Not every conversation is going to end in kumbaya. One of the strong points is, you know, and I will get to this, let's try to talk another time. Let's, let's, let's hold, let's hold here. Okay. Utilize language that demonstrates sensitivity to cultural groups of members of LBGTQ and, and other communities. Uh, and and it, feel free, I think I have this here, to ask people what they want to be called. And oftentimes people say, just don't call me late for dinner. But ask people, you know, one of the frustrations that I will hear some people say is for black people, everybody calls them African Americans. Well, not everybody is an African American. And, uh, you know, somebody's a Caribbean American, or somebody's African, or somebody's whatever. Um, or I, I use black, I use African American or black, but some people have strong feelings about that. Sometimes people look at anybody who has brown skin and call them a Muslim or a Middle Eastern, or, you know, they don't distinguish between various group, you know, Indians or it, it, some, and, and I've had people, I've had arguments in my classes about people. I had two people from, um, oh, uh, from Pakistan and one person from Pakistan was arguing that they were Middle Eastern and the other one said that she was Asian. Now, as they talked about it, one was Muslim, and one was Christian. And the one who was Christian thought of herself as more Asian than the one who was Muslim thought of himself as Middle Eastern. Now that's not always the breakdown, but in this case with these two, it was. Neither one of them you know, was Hindu um, or you know, other what would identify as Middle Eastern, but ask people how they want to be talked to, referred to, uh, how to pronounce their names. I, I'm terrible at pronouncing names. I'm working so hard on pronouncing people's names correctly because um you know there, there was a time when everybody's i mean still today i have asian um colleagues and friends who just westernize their name and you know that why should they have to do that my colleague bessie that is not her name that she grew up with uh, that is that's her, her western name and so trying to understand how people would prefer and she's fine with being called Bessie not everybody is for some people that's a real you know abandonment of their background and some people are recapturing that and of course you know uh President Obama grew up as Barry and then changed his name so people have a right to be referred to as they want okay uh keep the goals in mind and this this came to me from a, a woman who was a conservative and and let me just uh, read this and then comment on what she said uh keep your goals in mind and you know uh i, I can't i can't see my door in slides and try not to let different emotions sidetrack you and think about how you can get back and around these roadblocks there was a woman i know she's very quite conservative cares about race and and uh, topics of diversity but she said a lot of times she'll get into conversations with people and they want to talk about their hurt and their history and for her that is not a con she's not good at that kind of a conversation she's a scientist and she wants to talk about pragmatic solutions and so i and she said she's often gotten in trouble because people call her racist because she's not interested in hearing their story and and one of the things that we talked about is finding out what the goal of a conversation is. 
If the goal of a conversation is to hear each other out, to listen to one another, that's fine. If the goal of the conversation is to figure out how to uh, distribute um, funds fairly for grants, that's another conversation. And she finds it very difficult to have that you know, emotional conversation because she wants to hear the data and the facts. And so she has, she has much to offer. She's a very bright, interesting woman, but she feels she's not able to offer it because people think if she is not interested in hearing about their angst and, and experience, she has nothing to offer. Another guy who's a stockbroker, again, very conservative white guy, he said he wants to be helpful to some young African-American male in particular is what he said, by showing them how to do deal with stocks. He's having trouble connecting because of their different histories. And so he has to find somebody who he's able to connect with around, you know, stock, you know, trading and not get into their histories because he can't, you know, that's not something he can relate to. It may be a limitation of his, but it's just a, it's a fact. Um, sometimes the question is, what, what are we trying to accomplish here? It's not always, you know, it's some different situations call for different goals. And that's a, that's a tricky, tricky, tricky one. Okay. It's here. Um, let go of your need to be right. And because that's, that's a tough dynamic. And so sometimes it's like, how can we both get to a, 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 a good point. It's really, if you think you're right, it's really hard to give up that position. Um, and sometimes it's that you give me something to think about. And if you find that that's really hard for you to do, again, practice it. I don't know how many of you find that saying you're wrong is like yanking out your tonsils or, you know, having major surgery. I grew up in a family where certain people never said, I'm sorry. And so that's something that may, um, oh, I'm looking at, I think a couple people may, I jumped in with UC comments there that you want to, uh, oh, uh, somebody said, let me just jump back. I'm just getting a chance to look at uh, some of these comments. Uh, somebody said, I'm encountering age discrimination. Please comment on these at the end because I want to talk about it. Uh, be aware of your privilege. Somebody says, uh, what I'm hearing you say is, and somebody said, that's good, Catherine, I love your support of one another. 20 years ago, gay was uh, being used uh, as, as stupid at, or, or useless. That's okay. Have people stopped doing that? I pray that, that people don't use that expression, that's so gay anymore. I, I'm, I'm so glad if, uh, and, and at, at uh, one point people were saying, you know, I love you, man, no homo. Like, you know, please, can we stop that? Um, yes, uh, everyone wants uh, to be right, speak the truth, tell them, uh, oh, these are, are great comments. So sometime, I would, doesn't, your, your comment, so as I said, stop me if you see a comment and, and jump in there uh, and save these. So uh, again, just, to, I'm going to back up. Yes, try to give up this desire to, to be right, even, even if you know you're right. Sometimes to just let it go and say, you gave me something to think about because it's an investment. And, and back to the listening thing, I think of listening as an investment and then you can draw on it later. If somebody really feels that you have listened to them, I think you can say, do you feel that I have really listened to you? Can you, can you do the same for me? And so I think of listening and, and giving somebody the, 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 the power of your goodwill, that that's really important. Now, my husband and I laugh about this all the time. I, I have a hard time apologizing. My husband will apologize, but they'll do the same thing over again. So yeah, when you apologize, you also have to make amends. You have to change. Uh, okay, let me get to the next one here. All right. Uh, understand the complexity of these issues. There are shades of gray. Nobody is all right and nobody's all wrong. If the stuff was easy, we would have it solved by now. 
you know, the, the, this is difficult. And even though many people think we haven't moved forward, I mean, gee, we've moved forward because people are not, and I know it's not perfect. We do not have legal slavery. We're still dealing with uh, mass incarceration and other things. But the fact that these issues are on the table and are being talked about, and this is complex stuff, have the ability to see shades of gray and, and know that un, unless all hands are on deck, we're not gonna solve these problems. So see the complexity, be able to say, I think we both have a point. That's really important. I think we both have a point. And, and what's more, if you can articulate, if you can get to the point where you can say, I think you have a point. What, is there anything that I said that you think makes sense? I can respect that you think ABC. Um, I can respect that you don't know. I mean, I grew up with people. I never even, first of all, I never heard people use the word gay in you know a positive way until I was an adult. And then people started talking about transgender, et cetera. And many people in my generation are like, this didn't exist before. Like, where is it coming from? Well, of course it existed, but we didn't have language. We study communication. You know, if you didn't have language for something, you don't think it exists. And so there are people who are really trying to understand this. So, you know, understand that they have to move forward, that they have to understand there's, I, I talk to people who were, are transgender and they're like, I didn't know I was transgender because there wasn't any way to see it. There wasn't a lens for it. So understand that this stuff is not easy for anybody. There are shades of gray. And if somebody's not where you are, you have to meet them where they're starting. They will move forward, but you have to meet them where they're starting. So Anita, only because yes. you asked, we're at 1140, just so you know. Yes, yes, and, and perfect, I was wondering that. Um, again, remember this is not one conversation. I hope we can talk again. And just a few uh, meta communication questions. And meta communication is talking about how you talk. How can we get on the same side against this instead of battling each other? Uh, would it be possible for us to let go of our need to be right? What can we agree upon? So, and and what do you, why do you think it's so difficult for us to understand each other? So what I would like to do, especially with all of the wonderful comments that are in the chat, is to give folks, I'm gonna unshare, let, let me just see if I have anything else that I wanna say. Uh, oh. Oh, and that, that's my last slide. And if, if need be to say, would you be willing to agree to disagree? So I would like to just open it up and uh, I'm gonna ask either uh, Sandra or either one of our moderators to uh, put post comments there that I can comment on or ask people about, or people can type questions or comments in the chat right now and we can sort of process them because I think that's, that's important. And thank you for so actively listening as I was talking, it's great, it's great stuff. Anita, if I may, I just, came, I just put a comment in the chat while you were speaking because it actually came up in my class yesterday. Uh, we were discussing the concept of communication and, and listening and, and how valuable that was. Uh, and it was, you know, it was bookend right to this. And the comment came up, I hear what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but I don't necessarily agree and that's okay. Can you, can you comment on that? Yes, and, and I, I think that it's fine to say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that, but where are you going to go after that, I guess is my question. Mm -hmm. If you say, you know, I hear what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, I disagree with what you're saying, it, it sounds like the end of a conversation. Mm -hmm. but, but I would add to that an offer, like, well, uh, does somebody want to, does that sound like somebody in this room? Is that something somebody could comment on? Because I'm wondering, what would you say after that? It's like, goodbye, never again. Stay away from me. <laughs> and, and I have known, it, when, it, when worse comes to worse, I have known people say, I just stay away from that person. And, but that's, yeah, okay. It, it sounds like a bit of a rejection of your opinion. And, and it is, uh, it's like agree to disagree. And it's not the worst thing to say. It's, you know, it's not the worst thing to say, but it, it's not, and, and you also, have to know your trigger and your limits because if somebody's really making you angry when they say something for example if somebody says to you um i think it's fine for somebody to 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 be gay just don't be just don't put it in my face 
while heterosexuals are running around putting it in everybody's face all the time, that you could be triggered by that. Like if, that could just make you too angry that you can't have that conversation. That like, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I wanna wring your neck. But, but I, I think you have to decide if that's a conversation that you cannot have. And so maybe put it off for a while until you process it. Oh, I see lots of, okay. Pull it, I'm, I'm counting on my, uh, my moderator said, what, what are you saying uh, either, uh, Sandy? Quite a range of responses, but, Anita, quite a range of, a range of responses. We're gonna pull out some here as well. I didn't wanna interrupt you while you were, while you were going. No, 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 go. Uh, it could be the end of the conversation. It could be better. It sounds like an agree to disagree. Uh, I would say that, but only at the end of a conversation. Uh, quote, it's kind of like leaving the topic on the table for another discussion and for another time maybe, um, instead of one being led by your emotions. Mm -hmm. and and one of the conversations that doesn't it may not directly relate to you immediately, but I think you'll relate to this is I just had my first granddaughter, so this is front of mind for me. Right. But many times people would say, at what point? I mean, I would never be cut off my grandchild. At what point would you cut off parents or whoever from your kid? Like if they're homophobic, if they're racist, if they're whatever. And and you, I, I know your own parents like can be racist or can say things that you find horrible, and maybe even relate to people that you're dating, people that you love. Do you cut them off and never speak to them, or what? How do you handle it when you love somebody? and they're coming off with these kinds of comments. Mm. I'm homosexual in the communication between. Uh, does some, do you mind if I call on you folks? Is, is that, but, uh, okay, I, I see that hand. Let's, that is GM. Carpe Ganano. <laughs> I think that's, that might be Gertrude. Gertie, are you there? Go, go Gertie and unmute yourself. Unmute yourself and say your piece. Unmute yourself. Let's see if I can find it. I need a little sign that says. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to unmute you there, Gerd. You're still muted. <laughs> what she said is very important. It is. I just can't get her to <laughs> unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> I want to please forgive me for not being on, on time. I was on time but I could not get on. I've got to learn how to get onto Zoom myself. I had to start an account. That's what, this, that's what the whole thing was. What are you thinking as you're talking? my Gmail. What I want to say is this. I have a cousin. It's a third cousin, Danny. And he is married to his partner, who is a physicist and a scientist at a well-known pharmaceutical company. I call Danny on occasion when I need a recipe. I see Danny and, and his, and his I guess his friend. Oh, anytime uh, we get together with the family, I mean, I treat him as though, as though we're. I I don't feel that there's anything different except that he's my blood relative, not a close one. Yeah. I speak to his sister, and also I want you to know that I've dealt with all kinds of people, and that is thank you, Lord, for that because right from high school. We were, there were a lot of different kinds of people. I grew up with, with a lot of uh, uh, African Americans and down in Peterstown and Elizabeth, we all went to the same Christmas party looking for a gift. Number one. Number two, I went to high school. My friends were out, out, wonderful students. They were different races. It doesn't matter. I go to dancing school. I've been performing since eight years old on TV. Uh, I still, I was going to dancing school in New York City at Luigi's. I take tap. I'm with all kinds of people. My teachers are gay. What yeah. can I tell you? I love them all. Well, and let me ask Matthew to jump in. If you, and again, if you don't want to comment, What's please feel free. What's the difference? They're people. Is, is Matthew on here? I am. Yes, yeah. could you just share your comment so everybody uh, hears it? And thank you for, go ahead. Because I don't know yeah, what the right, big, right. Eruption is. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Matthew, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my uh, my sister and my brother-in-law did uh, cut off uh, his parents from their family. They have two daughters, and it was you know um, shortly after my uh, oldest niece was born, and um, 
my brother-in-law had a, had a, a tumultuous relationship with his father in the first place, but they uh, just had very, very different views. My, uh, I, I guess they're in, in-laws of in-laws. Uh, they, um, you know, had very conservative views that was not reflective of the family environment that they wanted to raise their daughter in. Now they have two girls, uh, and so they they have cut them off. And it's been five years that my um, oldest niece hasn't seen her other grandparents um, because of this decision. What, what do you um, think? In my that? particular family, we have um, my my in-laws, my wife's parents, are also quite conservative, but I don't want to cut my daughters off. And so my wife and I have constant conver- conversations about um, what how if they if they get exposed to something we're not particularly fond of how to have the conversation with our two daughters um in relation to that because they're going to have to in, encounter this at some point from someone somewhere and they're going to have to be able to deal with it in an appropriate way we can't i don't like the idea of just cutting off your family i'm not going to cut my I'm not going to cut people off from their grandkids, but I am. But so, but it, it is going to have to be these have these kinds of conversations and and teach you know our girls what we think is the best way to go forward. Thank you. That well said. Anybody else want to comment on the cutting off thing? Uh, and it's the that was Matthew. It was somebody else? Is Alexander? Alexander yeah, Salazar, yeah, I think you're looking for. And please, yes, go ahead. Are please, you still with us? Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Feel free. Uh, just about my comment, or yes, uh, yeah, well, the cutting off thing, or yes, com- say your comment and maybe expand oh. on it. Um, so I know I have parent. Um, I'm not. I have um, like a long lost brother in my country, and uh, my dad basically tried to. Um, it was all because of money. You know, he tried his best to help him out, but like he wasn't like raised with him. Mm-hmm. So, I, but I never really cut off people. People just like moved away in my life, like for the better. Mm-hmm. But like uh, with my parents, like I'm I'm Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, I I recently got back into my faith, mm-hmm. and my my mom's Christian, but my dad is like um, like in faith, mm-hmm. and um, it's in a lot of ways it's like. Like you, um, like it's just uh, it's ironic because like when when I was gonna tell him about like basically my whole life, what I'm doing like in my school and career and faith and someone I see, um, I went to my mom first because I trust her, and then I went to my dad when I came downstairs. He was attending like a Catholic mass online, so I understood like maybe I, you know, if you believe in God or no, like coincidentally like he's attending church, so that's great, and like. Um, just speaking to him, like he told me, like you know, in Spanish, like you're my friend first. Um, because the, the older I'm getting, like, um, the more I want a connection with my parents, because eventually I'm gonna be a parent, and like I just want them to be like to know what's going on in my life, to not like leave uh, left things in the dark. But like it, it was just like oh, in my head, I was I was doubting myself the whole time. But I always had my parents. And I, I love the idea. I think that if we start with goodwill and caring about somebody, whether it's a family member or whatever, I care about you as a human being, a lot of things are possible, a lot of disagreements, a lot of seeing things from different points of view. Because if you care about somebody, there are very few things that you're going to really let get in the way. Like, uh, I, I know people who stop speaking because their, their child or whatever, mar- or even friends, married somebody of a different race. But, oh, you know, they have kids or whatever, and it's hard not to like a little kid, <laughs> you know, and, and so uh, that often softens over time. So if you could keep that open. I see Erica has typed a comment. Can you, are you uh, here online? Hi. Yeah. Yep. Can you share, please? Sure. Um, I basically wrote about how, um, like, because there's much more um, openness and fluidity today, um, I think today's parents really have a responsibility to talk at an early age with their children about differences. Um, And I mentioned how, you know, growing up, 
Um, I, I lived in a Hispanic household and my grandparents had at times said homophobic things. What they didn't know is as a child, I was struggling with my sexuality. So I'm hearing these things and then I, I kind of wish that my parents had talked one-on-one -on -one with me or maybe said the opposite mm -hmm. so that I could know, you know, this thing isn't inherently bad just because my relatives said so. So I think, you know, future parents should definitely have these difficult discussions with their children because kids understand way more than we give them credit for. Yes, and you don't know what your seed you're planting. Let me ask you, what, have you come out to your family? Yes, yes, I'm bisexual and I, I came out to them maybe like 2012. Okay, and, and how did they respond? How, well, how did that conversation go, that difficult conversation? And did you bring your grandparents into it? Um, my parents told their parents themselves. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, I did see, like, like the first time I had a relationship with a woman, like, my grandma would kind of, like, snuff her and, like, not pay attention. But, you know, everyone, we have to give everyone the opportunity to change their mind because, you know what, when we lost a family member and my girlfriend was there for me, my grandma changed her mind. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It, it is it is shocking how um, moments like that will change things. Uh, my good friend is African American, married to a white guy. His family didn't speak; they were horrible. And finally, you know, they, you know, they pulled away from them. And he had triple bypass surgery. And I don't know what happened when he was in surgery, but the first thing he said when he came out is, "I need to talk to Terry." And that was the the African-American woman. And he just, uh, you know, he had a Scrooge moment, I guess, but she was such a kind person that she just opened her heart. And so you, it sounds like you were there to keep your heart open. And often it is very difficult to do that. Uh, anybody, uh, oh, I see some, uh, uh, Taylor, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi. Yeah, what um, do you think? Earlier Earlier, I just um, remember that you were interested in, you know, hearing about some of the genetic breakdowns, people who had done some DNA tests. Uh, hopefully, 23andMe counts in those tests. Oh, it's one of the better ones. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ancestry. So, based on the information that I already knew about my family, um, my mom, I, I, I'm a black woman. My mom identifies as a, a black woman. My dad, um, he's African American. Uh, his real birth mother uh, is white. She's a Jewish woman, but my dad had no connection with her. She had given him and his twin sister up for adoption very, very early. But it was interesting to find that um, I, my genetics broke down to 53.3% Sub-Saharan African and 45.9% European. And with the Jewish component, it was actually 24.4% Ashkenazi Jewish. So it was interesting. I, I grew up in a town that was predominantly white and Jewish. Um, and so it was, I've always found that very interesting. But also the DNA changes. Like I've gotten increases and decreases in some of those percentages as well. So that's always a question as to why that happens. And, and I could explain why that happens. I, I, I won't now, but it, it has to, you know, this stuff does not come from heaven. It is um, scientists who decide how they're going to categorize things. And good scientists are going to come basically to similar conclusions, but when they update and get new information. But I, I do want to comment on the identity thing, because one of the things that has come it, from all this testing is that you identify as a Black woman. Now, genetically, you could say you're biracial or multiracial or however you want to say. And, and back to communication, there weren't words for that. So somebody said to me, I didn't know biracial was a thing. And so um, your identity may be changed by these tests. And, and what kinds of conversations do you want to have with these Jewish relatives of yours? And imagine, you know, somebody giving up their child because of its race, you know, their biological child because of its race. And, and of course, back when you were born, it was a bigger deal than it is today. So uh, having, I mean, talk about a rich conversation, both with yourself and with some of these people who may be living, who may not be, who may want to dialogue with you, is, is so important. And it tells us so much about structural racism. You know, that your genetics 
is a story about race in America. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's most interesting having conversations with other black people about my race because when they ask me, when I get the tell telltale question of what are you, I always say, well, genetically, this is what I am, but I, I identify as a black woman. I was raised as a black woman. I was not raised in a, in a household with black and white. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a very black experience. Uh, so that's always kind of the distinction that I have to say. And I mean, I grew up with many very light-skinned African-Americans, and so I went back and tested some of them. Some of them have like 10, 12% African background, and I'll argue with them, and they will argue me down that they're black, you know? I said, do you consider yourself multi? And then they get mad at me, and I'm like, that's the end of the conversation. But so much for on gun. but we come back. Um, but yes, and, and that's why I love the genetic stuff, because it's such a complicated, rich conversation. So th thank you for that. Uh, my grandmother. Oh, oh, let me ask. Uh, is that Glennis? Are you with us, yeah. Glennis? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, that's okay. Can my video is hard to get unmuted. Yeah, tell me about your uh, experience with the family. Yeah. So my grandfather, till his death, when well, he's one out of uh, fourteen kids, and the youngest one um, married. So we're Chinese Filipino. Um, but there's so my grandfather said this all Chinese so his younger brother my uncle married a Filipino lady and to his death even when he died and all throughout his life um, he completely I, I guess you can say like ignored and everything that happened like all the parties and stuff like that he would never invite him and he wouldn't do anything because he married a Filipino lady and had nothing to do with Chinese and to his death, he didn't forgive him. But now everyone else in like the later years, everyone's like intermingled now. We have like so many mixes race. And that's how I came along. But like, are, are you it mixed was, like, Filipino and time. Chinese? Pardon? Are you mixed Filipino and Chinese? Yeah, I'm Filipino, Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese, and Japanese. So I'm, I'm really okay. mixed. <laughs> <laughs> You're a real Asian. <laughs> you got all. Yeah, just, just call me Asian. Yeah, yeah. But like back then, like, with, with his kind of mindset coming from there, but he lived in the Philippines. That's the thing. So that's why it was kind of like really hard. It's like, who else he would marry? Like there's not many Chinese besides yourself here at the moment. So it was like that well, whole my, situation. My colleague, <laughs> Bethany Lawton is Chinese from the Philippines and she knocks my socks off telling me stuff about race there she said they were at a wedding a cousin chinese they if they're being chinese is really important to them they were at a wedding one of the cousins married a filipino you know an, an indigenous filipino person and they said the whole conversation is why didn't he just have an affair with her why uh, would he marry her and because and and it i don't know if you've studied hofstede and the different um you know high power distance low power distance but the Philippines are a high power distance culture where people kind of accept their place in society. And she said, it's accepted. It's like white, Chinese, Filipino, you know, and, and that you're not supposed to marry across those lines and that it's a huge deal. And when she married a white American, they said, as long as they're not black, we can accept that. So, um, it, wacky. And imagine taking, me, <coughs> imagine taking that to your deathbed. And, and not seeing your family. But you're so right. People are now mixing up. Is there much more mixing now in your family? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's so, so much more. Uh, let me get a couple more comments. I've, uh, uh, Crystal, uh, you want to comment? You said, I can relate. I was wondering what you could relate to. Um, I was so, it was just when Taylor was talking. Um, some of the things that she was saying, like, I can relate to. Um, I often, like, so I was born in the Caribbean, um, and I was, like, raised in New York. And, like, sometimes, like, I would get, like, when people would ask me, like, where are you from? I would, there was a point in my time, and, like, when I was younger, where I struggled answering that question because um, I didn't know if, whether to say, like, where I was born um, or where I was, like, raised. So I kind of just, like, I say like I was born in the Caribbean raised here in New York um but also like I also did a uh the DNA test um I don't remember the exact percentage because it was a long time ago but I know like um it said I'm uh Spaniard um from West Africa specifically Togo mm -hmm. and 
uh, Taino. It didn't say Taino because it doesn't include like yeah. those groups mm -hmm. um, yet, but um, that's what it says. And like, mm -hmm. it's like we're like being from the Dominican Republic. It's like, it's like we're literally a mixture of different like races and it, it, it's it's weird to me like yeah i'm dominican but like if i look into like what i really am like it's more complicated than just that oh, absolutely and, and the average african-american has about 20 percent european ancestry um yes. and so many of these things that we talk about as races are really ethnic groups african-americans are a, a a particular kind of mix and when i look at some of the international studies they talk about an African-American DNA profile, and it's not the same as an African. It's not the same as, you know, as, as other groups. So this, when uh, I'm sure you've heard the idea that race is socially constructed. And, and when we talk about, and, and this, this is what it means, uh, and when we talk about dialogue, the first step of dialogue is getting clear with who you are. That's the first step because before you step in, and of course it doesn't happen one at a time because that's not the world that we live in. But think about the fear that you have of what somebody will say to you. And it's, uh, several of you have talked about what you've been called or how people, whether it's you know uh, people talking about gay people or people asking what you are. People ask you things that can cause you to have an emotional meltdown. With, did you ever, and uh, uh, Crystal, did you ever feel attacked because somebody asked you what you were or somebody questioned what you were? Did you ever have insecurity about that? Yes, definitely. And, like, and I just, just, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, I would just, like I was saying, I just would feel like I didn't know. Like I always felt like there was a right answer or like being ashamed of like where I'm from. And that was also like back in a couple years ago. A couple years ago, things were different. Like nowadays, like, a lot of it's it's different it's better it's gotten a little bit better and and do you do you have curly hair i do did you feel pressured to straighten your hair yes yes <laughs> well yeah when i was younger like when i was younger i would just um mostly straighten my hair my mom would straighten my hair because she would like deal with it um after a while like i just started curling it but even like like going back to like back in the days, like it wasn't acceptable. And now it's like, it's, it's a trend now. Like everybody loves curls. Like everybody girl, loves right. a foreign girl. Like everybody, like it's different. It's, it's weird, but and it's. Even, well, and even to make you an exotic is a strange thing, you know, like that's yes, also. Yes. It's, it's kind of weird to me, but. Yeah. Cause you're just you, but me more. Yeah project something exotic onto you. And, and so the first step is really to get comfortable with who you are. And it doesn't mean that other people are ever going to be comfortable with it, but it means that you have to be able to articulate who you are and why, because before you start engaging other people, like when they engage you, they're going to put in front of you these very things we're talking about. I see Amanda's hand up and I wanted to acknowledge that. Where are you, Amanda? Well, I mean, oh. I'm right here. Oh, and, I interject go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry, Sandra. Before we go there, I just want to alert you that we're at 12.07. Oh, oh gosh. Well, this will be our last comment. There's two, yeah, and there's two good questions on the table. So you let me know when you're ready for it. <laughs> Let's hear from Amanda. I'll quickly answer the last ones and we'll get out of here. <laughs> sorry about that. No, thank you. I'll thank make you. it quick. But um, I just wanted to say that I really could relate to uh, Crystal just because for me, like, um, my mom, she's Haitian, and my dad is from the Dominican Republic, and they're together. And whenever people ask me what I am, I say both. And they'll always attack me, and they'll be like, oh, well, you're dark, so you're not Dominican. And I'm like, okay. And then coming here, going to school with, like, a lot of African-American people, I want to, like, fit in with them also, but I'm also not an African-American and can't relate to certain things that they can relate to. So it's kind of hard to like oh. align yourself with everything right and then people beat you up because you're not a good kind of black person and you're not a good you know <laughs> and like wow and you could go crazy and that's why the first conversations with yourself let's hear the two questions that uh so i know that professor sullivan has a question or comment and there's one more here about i think this one might be well not easy uh, we, uh when somebody says to you we talk too much about diversity uh what we really need to be doing is talking about unity what is your what is your reaction to that 
well, to me, it's the same thing. Like if somebody says we're going to talk about uni, like what, what are we talking about? Like it's not to me and I, it's to me, it means I don't want you to talk about you. I can't tolerate that. You know, I, we're going to pretend we're all alike. And what that means is it will default to the power group. So I love talking. About, I find that I'm closer to people that I can talk to about who I am. And in, in, in whatever sense that is, whether it's my likes or my, you know, my purchasing preferences or my race, I don't want to put something off the table because somebody thinks it's too painful. I think we, we love people, we respect people when we feel like we can share who we are. And if somebody says, I want to hear you talk about race, it's, I don't want to hear you talk about you. And I hear that as shutting me down. So that, um, I, I don't think unity is, and, and I, I've heard people say that, I don't think unity is that we're all together. I think unity is that we default to the power group. Um, and there's one more. Uh, I think, uh, Jerry, I think you had a comment. Or I just had a brief comment, and actually it's something I've been wondering about, and it gets back to the beginning when you discussed the DNA, the DNA project and with identity. I'm wondering, in your work, did you ever encounter somebody who, who did the 23andMe or, or, or whatever test that they're choosing, and found the surprise. So maybe somebody who's part of their their um, their familial tree that they didn't know existed, or another whole other portion, or even you know when they got those results, you know science science decisions aside, took a stark look at them and said, "That's that's not me," and and really had maybe a moment. I'm just wondering how you would comment on that. Yes, every time we run a like a large group, there's at least somebody who finds out something that kind of knocks their socks off. It's not a, they have a parent that they didn't expect or a racial background that they didn't expect, a, an ethnic background that they didn't expect. And right now we're working on a, uh, ultimately a book about people who indeed find those things. So yes, and, and I would say about, there's a percentage of people who finds a little something, everybody finds something that's kind of interesting. Maybe I'm Irish instead of British or, you know, what, whatever. And then there are, you know, people who find something, as a, there's, I'm sorry, a small group who are like, this is basically what I thought, like, why am I paying money for this? Then people in the middle who find like something interesting, even though it's not shocking. And then there is, you know, that percentage who really find something. And then that couple off who were like, okay, this is, dry, you know, and uh, yes. And, and we're trying to deal with that. Uh, I'm actually going to turn it back to you two uh, to wind things up. And just to say, you know, I could talk to you all all day, but I know our, our time is nigh and it's really been a pleasure. What a, this must be a wonderful group to teach. So thank you so, so, so very much for being here and so active. So Jerry and Sandra, let me turn it back. And thank my you so much, Chris. Dr. Foreman. Uh, Sandra, is there anything you want to say before I make any remarks? Awesome. Obviously, there is so much that needs to be said. We all there's so many people who still want to keep the conversation going. So I, I think that this was wonderful. There were so many awesome takeaways. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I hope that we are able to remain in touch with you. And I urge everybody to read a little bit more about what Dr. Foman works on. Thank you. Sorry. I would echo all those comments and I would thank everyone too for being here equally as well. Dr. Foman, we couldn't have done this without you and, and your scholarship and and uh, your continued good work in this space. And everybody who's joining us today shows a commitment to, to curiosity, right? And interest in this space and, and how we have these conversations. And, and last but not least, I should not uh, be remiss, again, to not thank our sponsors and also Dr. Lynch, if you're still there, thank you for starting us on this journey and, and sticking with us as we continue with it. For anybody on the call today, this is the second lecture. Uh, there is more to come. This recording will be posted later on in case you wanna watch it once more. Uh, in addition to that, keep your eyes and ears open because our third lecture coming in Mar uh, February, will be posted soon. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, be well, and wish you all good uh, 2022. And, and, and just because we had a minute, I didn't know if Chris wanted to say anything before we're out, sure. just because we had a minute. Dr. Lynch? I think you hit, hit all the key points. So thank you so much, Anita. I knew you would be fantastic. This is even <laughs> much, much better than fantastic. So oh, that's why I called on you, Chris. Have <laughs> 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 the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>